The Center for the Improvement of Human Functioning International presents this luncheon lecture. Today's topic, Many Ways Vitamin C Affects Cancer and Health. Your presenter, Dr. Hugh Burton. Anyway, I'd like to begin by sharing a little bit of uh, my own odyssey in order to give you a glimpse of how I became uh, interested in vitamin C as a therapeutic modality. <clears throat> my early odyssey and subsequent experiences have sustained my interest in the therapeutic benefits of vitamin C over the span of uh, several decades. Uh, I was not born with an interest in uh, vitamin C. In fact, my first real awareness of uh, the substance which is essential uh, to human life uh, came in the early 1950s uh, when I was a pre-medical student at the University of Wisconsin. Because of a severe sore throat, I went to a very knowledgeable doctor who diagnosed a streptococcal throat infection. He offered me two options at that time. Oreomycin, which was the new antibiotic of the day, uh, he said would clear up my problem in three to four days. Or he said I could uh, get rid of my streptococcal throat infection in a week by taking vitamin C. As a student living in near poverty, the choice between $7 for the oreomycin and the 50 cents for the vitamin C was really very easy for me. I chose the vitamin C and all my symptoms cleared within six days. Then in the late 1970s I discovered something which amazed me, some of you are aware of. For many months, uh, for research purposes, my plasma vitamin C was checked on a regular basis. It was always in the normal range, fluctuating between 1.3 and 1.7 milligrams per cent. Until the time when I had a spider bite on my left thigh. The next morning, I was scheduled for my periodic vitamin C de level determination. The laboratory called me to report that no vitamin C was detectable. And I thought, well, I'll fix that. And had one of our nurses give me 15 grams or 15,000 milligrams of vitamin C intravenously to satisfy my curiosity and to determine the effectiveness of the intravenous vitamin C. The next morning, my plasma vitamin C level was rechecked. Again, to my amazement, no vitamin C was detectable and none was detectable each morning for the next four mornings. Even though the previous day I would have had another 15,000 milligrams of vitamin C intravenously. Only on the fifth morning, uh, when the bite was well on the way to resolution, did my plasma vitamin C begin to rise into the detectable but scurvy range. And it was several more days uh, <coughs> before my plasma reached its usual adequate vitamin C level. The spider bite episode uh, led me to start measuring vitamin C in people on a regular basis. We did sizable groups like nurses before and after an eight-hour shift, athletic teams during practice and before a game, albeit not winning teams, but athletic teams, <coughs> and police rookies after an eight-hour shift. These studies showed that it was apparently very easy to deplete one's vitamin C just by engaging in what for them was their usual work or activity. One police officer I uh, particularly remember and stands out in my mind because at the end of a night shift both his urine and plasma had no detectable vitamin C. In addition to the stresses encountered by police officers, he had a rather deficient dietary intake during the night. I vividly, rec <laughs> vividly recall all he had during his busy eight hours were three cups of coffee two cola drinks and a chicken wing. As my good friend Dr. Emanuel Sharaskin has said so often, most doctors believe people are not deficient in vitamin C because they never measure it. Thanks to what I learned first by happenstance and then by measurement, my vitamin C consciousness has been forever changed. From believing we're adequately fed and therefore have enough vitamin C, I adopted a more reality-based awareness that a significant portion of our population does not get enough of this nutrient. Dr. Mark Levine at the National Institutes of Health in the Washington has made uh, great strides in determining that normal people under normal circumstances, actually he did seven young males who are healthy, require 200 milligrams of vitamin C daily 
rather than the long USA recommended amount of 60 milligrams per day per person. You know, if you go to Canada, it's only 40 milligrams per day. Something happens when you go across the border. <laughs> now it is uh, uh, my hope, of course, that extensive studies to determine levels of vitamin C in response to factors such as stress, toxins, and insect bites will be forthcoming. And we will certainly do some of those studies here at the center. At this point, you know, we don't even know how much six mosquito bites take in terms of vitamin C. In 1989, when we began our RECNAC cancer research project, I trust you all know what RECNAC stands for. Let me see if I've got a little overhead here. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. No, I guess I don't. Well, we'll get to that. We started reviewing five decades of cancer research. Of course, we reviewed the medical, many clinical reports from Cameron and Pauling, which showed that cancer patients did much better when orally supplemented with high doses of vitamin C. We also reviewed the reports uh, from the Mayo Clinic, which on the surface contradicted Cameron and Pauling's work. What surprised me as we continued search was the excellent work of Benet et al. at the National Cancer Institute, published in 1969. And then the work of Stanley Bram at the Cancer and Immunogenics Institute in France, reported in 1980. Benet et al. were able to demonstrate the preferential toxicity of vitamin C to tumor cells, which were Ehrlich ascites carcinoma cells. This meant that at the proper dose or concentration, they had found that vitamin C killed tumor cells and was not toxic to normal cells. As we all know, this is or should be the goal of all cancer chemotherapeutic agents. The research team also discovered the apparent mechanism for preferential toxicity, the intracellular production of hydrogen peroxide. Tumor cells contain between 10 and 100 fold less of the enzyme catalase when compared uh, to normal cells. Because there is so little catalase in the tumor to quench the peroxide produced by the vitamin C, toxic products build up and ultimately destroy the tumor cells. The group was sufficiently enthused by their findings that they offered the following conclusion, which I think I have here. <clears throat> Quote, in our view, the future of effective cancer therapy will not rest on the use of host toxic compounds, now so widely employed, but upon virtually host non-toxic compounds that are lethal to cancer cells, of which ascorbate represents an excellent prototype example of a number of potentially effective combinations now under investigation. So this was in 1969, 30 years ago. Where it usually takes 40 years, so another 10 years things will be really good moving along. Bram et al. Uh, demonstrated that several human and animal melanoma cell lines were from between 2 and 20 times more sensitive to the cytotoxic activity of vitamin C than normal cells. Both Benade and Bram demonstrated the preferential toxicity of vitamin C to tumor cells. This mechanism is very different from what was postulated as the extracellular matrix modulation by Cameron and Pauling. That's what they thought was primarily responsible for the life-extending qualities of the vitamin C in their observations. Such studies and our own clinical observations since 1980 led us to begin research to determine if we could demonstrate preferential toxicity of vitamin C against a variety of tumor cells. Many of our results have not been published and some of the details we won't discuss right now. Over the years though, we have uh, studied over 150 different compounds for anti-tumor activity. A few of the compounds we have tested work synergistically with vitamin C providing greater anti-tumor activity with lower doses. The necessity for a faster and more economical method for counting the vast number of experiments we were performing led to the development of a new fluorometric method for the determination of the number of viable cells. As a result of that, we can test compounds for their anti-tumor activity more than 50 times faster than was possible before. An article outlining that technique appeared in anti-cancer research. If 
anybody ever wants to look that up, why it's available. <coughs> now let me get a little more specific uh, with our own clinical and experimental experiences with intravenous vitamin C, which we consider to be a very safe form of adjunctive therapy in the treatment of cancer. In uh, this little presentation, I should say that vitamin C, uh, for the purpose of this presentation, refers to ascorbic acid uh, or the use of sodium ascorbate. All in vitro studies, which means not in living animals, but in test tube situations or in flasks, uh, we're using sodium ascorbate. All intravenous vitamin C refers to the use of vitamin C for injection, buffered to a pH range of 5.5 to 7. As already mentioned, vitamin C has potential as a chemotherapeutic agent. Rather than possessing adverse side effects, as most chemotherapeutic drugs do, vitamin C has side benefits. Come on in such as increasing collagen production and enhancing immune function. We began to study the effects of vitamin C on cultured tumor cells in 1991. We found that vitamin C was preferentially toxic to tumor cells. It killed tumor cells before killing normal cells. Our early findings of prevent preferential vitamin C toxicity were published in 1994. In that paper, we also described a so-called serum effect. Vitamin C's toxicity was reduced by the presence of human serum. Serum's inhibitory effect led us to the conclusion that the concentration of vitamin C, which was toxic to tumor cells in our early studies, which was only 5 to 50 milligrams percent, would not necessarily be toxic in humans. We therefore began a series of experiments in which we sought to more closely mimic the in vivo, or in living people, tumor microenvironment. In particular, we began, began testing for toxicity of vitamin C toward cultured tumor cell lines using dense monolayers and hollow fiber tumor models to mimic the three-dimensionality of tumors. We might have something here with that. We used human sera as culture media to include the serum inhibitory uh, activity seen in previous assays. Using these new culture conditions, we found that the cytotoxic concentration of vitamin C for most human tumor cell lines was indeed much higher than previously described. We can see the differences here, I'll point out in a minute. Just to bring you over the years since we started doing intravenous vitamin C more than 20 years ago, of course the first notion as mentioned was that it tends to wall off cancer cells because of collagen production. Then we were excited that in cell culture we could knock out cancer cells very easily uh, with uh, vitamin C and then uh, we found out of course we needed higher and higher doses in real tumors. And with this uh, shows that a, a much lower, if you look at these, the, the dense hollow fiber, sparse monolayer, sparse, sparse monolayer means that you just have one layer of cells or maybe two in a flask. So the pink of the spa, sparse monolayer shows that you can knock out cancer cells with a relatively low dose of uh, vitamin C. The dense monolayer, which is a thicker layer of cells, shows that you need more and if you do the the hollow fiber, which is mimicking little tumors, you can see it requires a much greater amount of vitamin C. So what we've learned as we're going along is that it takes more vitamin C in a living person to knock out cells than, than in a little monolayer where they're easily uh, influenced by the vitamin C. Given this information that higher concentrations of vitamin C were required to become cytotoxic to tumor cells, we needed to learn more about the pharmacokinetics of vitamin C. There were no data on the concentrations of vitamin C that were achievable in human beings after high-dose intravenous vitamin C. 
We therefore began a series of experiments to yield data for modeling pharmacokinetics of high doses of vitamin C. We gave a series of vitamin C infusions to a 72-year-old male who was a wonderful guinea pig, um, who was in excellent physical condition, except for slowly progressing non-metastatic uh, cancer of the prostate. Before the infusions and at intervals thereafter, blood was drawn from a heparin lock, not the site of infusion. The plasma was separated and analyzed for plasma vitamin C concentrations using a micro plate uh, assay. Let me see if I have some of those results here. Well, before doing that, let me just show you another. This is, I think, Doc, is this from Dr. Kashari? I'm not sure. I think so. <coughs> this gives a little rundown of um, the effect of vitamin C in colon uh, and looking at the concentration. If you can see on the on the left, uh, the blue means they're healthy cells, they're living. The green, they're dying. And the red, they're dead. As, as the vitamin C increases, you can see very clearly that more and more cells have been killed off. And uh, very few, in the, in the case of the 667 milligrams per deciliter percent, only 9% were still living. So 91% were killed using this. This is for our <coughs> wonderful guinea pig who uh, was very patient and had many, many samples taken over many times. Anyway, we can observe here that, that uh, let me bring it down a little bit. There are several, gra several graphs there. The one with the triangle at the bottom is uh, giving 30 grams intravenously in 80 minutes. The one with the square is giving 60 grams in 80 minutes. The one with the circles uh, is 60 grams in the first 60 minutes, followed by 20 grams in the second 20 minutes. So you can see, if we want to get up to a what we consider a therapeutic range, which is in the range of 400 milligrams per cent, by giving the uh, 60 grams intravenously in 80 minutes, followed by the lower dose for 20 minutes, we, we go for a long time in which the therapeutic amount is there, or enough to kill uh, cancer cells. We actually had a 240 minute period, uh, as you can see, in which the vitamin C plasma concentration was near or above 400 milligrams per cent. We actually then co computer modeled, uh, or conjectured at least, uh, what the uh, therapeutic blood ascorbate levels would be in treating people at one hour at 60 grams an hour, two hours at 60 grams per hour, and one hour at 60 grams per hour, followed by six hours uh, at 10 grams per hour. So you can see you can sustain uh, quite a bit uh, of vitamin C, which is the goal. And uh, prolonged infusions at uh, higher doses obviously give the highest peak values. Well, a trickle infusion can be used to maintain plasma C at the desired level. To more closely study the uh, probability of in vivo cytotoxic effects on intravenous vitamin C, we planned and performed the following experiment. Dense monolayers of human prostate tumor cells, which is PC3, were created in microplates. These are little, little wells that hold the, the cells. Um, a patient with cancer of the prostate was given 65 grams of intravenous vitamin C in 500 cc's of sterile water for injection over 65 minutes. Samples for plasma and serum were drawn before the infusion and at intervals thereafter from a heparin lock separate from the infusion lock, uh, site. 
The final blood draw was five hours after the infusion began. The collected plasma was then tested for vitamin C concentration, and the serum was heat inactivated and used as a culture media for the prostate tumor cells. The cells were incubated for five days when the numbers of viable tumor cells were determined using a standard counting system. The results uh, should be in another graph here. The time is along the, the bottom of the graph. The survival percentage is on the left, and the plasma scorbate level is uh, on the right. You can see that uh, greater than 97 percent cytotoxicity was observed for the serum samples taken at 35, 65, and 95 minutes after the beginning of intravenous vitamin C. During those periods, the plasma concentration was greater than 400 milligrams per deciliter. After that time, the toxicity decreased. The last sample taken with a vitamin C concentration of 213 milligrams percent resulted in 64 inhibi percent inhibition compared to the controls. What this is saying, if you give enough vitamin C, the cancer cells get knocked out, is the short version of that. It also shows the effects of human serum removed from the patient before and in intervals after intravenous infusion of vitamin C on cultured human prostate cells, which is the, again, the survival. Is that, is that clear as mud or is that uh, something you can uh, understand? So the, the, the bar at the left, time is zero. You see there's 100 percent survivor. Then we drop down with the, with the high uh, ascorbate levels or vitamin C levels, and you see that the, the cells are pretty well knocked out. And as the concentration decreases, the cell survival is uh, better, but again, far less than 100 percent. Because uh, plasma concentrations of vitamin C of greater than 200 milligrams percent are problematic to maintain, we began looking for ways to increase the sensitivity of tumor cells to vitamin C. During experimentation, we found that lipoic acid Here's a formula of lipoic acid. Lipoic acid uh, is, is a very interesting antioxidant in that it's the only one <coughs> that we know of that's both water and oil soluble. It, of course, also recycles vitamin C and therefore can tremendously enhance the tumors toxic effects of vitamin C. Um, we'll show the response. Again, I think one of Dr. Joe's graphs, which is also on the wall over there. The, the dose response of um, tumor cells in the hollow fiber model, again, those are little, little tiny tumors, Exposed to vitamin C with and without lipoic acid is what this graph is all about. Uh, lipoic acid decreased the dose of vitamin C required to kill 50 percent of the, the tumor cells from 700 milligrams per deciliter to 120 milligrams per deciliter, which is an enormous change. So by giving lipoic acid with vitamin C, uh, we can uh, have a much more effective dosage level. <coughs> Another uh, interesting fact of vitamin C, it's well known that vitamin C is required for the hydroxylation of proline and that low levels of vitamin C can be a limiting factor in the production of collagen. Again, when we initially started, that's what we thought we were doing with vitamin C. We thought we were producing more collagen, which tends to wall off cancer cells. Because many tumor cells produce collagenase and other proteolytic enzymes, we wanted to determine if vitamin C supplementation would increase collagen production by tumor cells, thereby having a balancing effect on collagenase, the enzyme. 
In an experiment, we supplemented culture tumor cells with vitamin C concentrations that are achievable with oral supplementation, which means 2 to 4 milligrams percent in the plasma. Then we measured the collagen produced using a well-known method. We found that, indeed, these concentrations of vitamin C greatly increased the production of collagen. Let me see if I have a little slide on that. This uh, fairly clearly shows that uh, collagen production uh, increases uh, as ascorbic acid is added to the culture media. It's interesting to note that when uh, some of our staff were performing the cytotoxicity assays of vitamin C against the PC3 human prostate ca cancer cell lines uh, using concentrations as high as 300 milligrams per deciliter, uh, they were unable to detach the remaining live cells from the tissue culture flasks using trypsin and EDTA, which is a standard way of doing that. In some cases, uh, several days of treatment with high concentrations of collagenase were required to detach the cells. One of the researchers remembers literally chipping cells off the plastic flasks. In other words, the cells stuck tremendously indicating that the collagen was rather strong. Um, prostate uh, tumor cells are very resistant to high doses of vitamin C, and it may be that they're so rapidly using the vitamin C for collagen production that it doesn't have as much time as in other cell lines and is therefore less toxic. Uh, we have a clinical note that uh, is of interest, and that is that we have several patients diagnosed with prostate cancer who have taken continuous uh, large oral doses of vitamin C for many years and do not progress to metastatic disease in spite of relatively large tumors in their prostates. Perhaps their tumor cells are kind of gluing themselves in place by high collagen production. We've recently completed a phase one clinical trial of high dose intravenous vitamin C at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Subjects there with end stage metastatic gastrointestinal cancer which means they were not expected to live more than a couple of weeks, were infused with intravenous vitamin C continuously for 24 hours for eight weeks using a pump. They, uh, you know, one of the things that's a problem when we're dealing with things like vitamin C, the way standard tests are done like this, or phase one tests, uh, you give animals a dose of whatever the toxic compound is and whatever kills half of them, that's what you give to the humans. And then you do a phase one trial to see what what we'll do. Well, the problem with vitamin C, of course, it doesn't kill animals. You can give an animal their entire weight in vitamin C and they're happy, so we had to start out with, uh, even though we've been doing this for 20 years, we had to do this to prove that it didn't kill people. So we started out with 10 grams a day, then 20, then 30, then 40, then 50, and that's over a 24-hour period uh, continuously for a couple of months. Uh, anyway, there was no significant changes in their blood counts or chemistry profiles. The, since the doses were given over 24 hours, the highest plasma concentration of vitamin C in any of those people was only 66 milligrams per deciliter, which of course is not uh, therapeutic. One of the uh, fascinating facts that I've discovered uh, is that our government has different standards for humans and other animals who, like us, do not make our, their own vitamin C, as of course most animals do. Uh, we. Uh, was doing some reading on a recent trip. And uh, if you're keeping guinea pigs in the laboratory, uh, the government mandates that you should give them 200 milligrams of vitamin C per kilogram of weight, not per body, but per kilogram. Um, and if they're pregnant or lactating, they should have twice that amount. Uh, one of the fascinating things I did reading about this, again, in terms of how much vitamin C one should have, if you take guinea pigs, I guess everybody knows that only a few animals don't make vitamin C. Us, guinea pigs, a couple of birds, monkeys, uh, things like that. So all other animals make vitamin C. A self-respecting goat will make 30,000 milligrams on demand. Uh, maybe that's why they can eat anything that comes their way. By the way, in, in the studies that I was reading, uh, which I wasn't aware of until a couple of weeks ago, uh, is that in order to start resaturating the adrenal glands, which are huge users of vitamin C, 
uh, in the animal studies, you have to give a guinea pig 900 milligrams per kilogram of uh, vitamin C for, in order to get the vitamin C to, to be going into their adrenal glands. And since that's a huge user, I think that's uh, quite interesting. Uh, so at my, at, uh, at my weight, roughly of 100 kilograms, um, that way, if you do that times 900, that would be 9,000 milligrams of vitamin C. So I've been taking 12,000 milligrams of vitamin C every day for 20 years. I had no idea what, that the guinea pigs needed that C, so maybe that's supplying my adrenals. Uh, we have a little time. Uh, I, I would like to say that we're, you know, we're still looking for more people with metastatic kidney cancer because we've had very good results with that. Uh, we, we evaluate and treat them free for a year uh, in the hope that we will help them get rid of their uh, metastatic kidney cancer. Uh, Dr. Davis, who some of you know, is, is a big proponent of N of 1 studies, which means you start and stop something uh, and then start and stop it again. And we have a wonderful N of 1 study in a lady in Montreal who came here, uh, I guess, three years ago and had uh, multiple metastatic lung lesions uh, from a kidney primary. So she took, and you kind of lose track of these people, she, she went back to, to Montreal with our recommendations and things like that. Uh, she took intravenous vitamin C for four months and then stopped because her metastases stopped growing. That was her criteria. It wouldn't be ours, but anyway, they stopped growing. So then she called back uh, about to Memorial Day to say that her metastases started growing again. And, uh, you know, I came on gluten, wondered why she didn't continue the vitamin C before. But anyway, uh, so she came back and we reevaluated and, and got her started again with intravenous vitamin C in Montreal. And when we last heard, her, her lesions were shrinking up mightily. And hopefully this time she'll continue the vitamin C until they're gone instead of just being happy that they stopped growing. But it's a very nice end of one study. She had her metastatic disease. She took some vitamin C, albeit not enough, but it stopped the growth. And this is two years later, two and a half years later. Uh, she's, they're growing again, she's taking the vitamin C again, and they're shutting them down again and making them smaller. So uh, that's a very nice uh, uh, N of one uh, study. So we're looking for uh, more people with uh, uh, renal cell carcinoma. We've had a couple of people who've gotten over it totally. We have several others that are uh, in the study, but we would like a few more uh, just to demonstrate that maybe it's useful. We, <coughs> we just added a fellow the other day who doesn't really qualify uh, for the study because he, he still has his primary tumor. He has a huge <coughs> renal tumor, and uh, I don't know how he's going to do. He has 32 lung metastases, but we've uh, added him not to be in the, in the real study, but just to see how he does. Hopefully we can improve his... Uh, a uh, sense of well-being. I have uh, a lot of case studies that we could do, but I don't think I'll do that right now because I'd like to leave a little time for some questions. So all this business, whatever I've been saying, I'd like to summarize a little bit as to what I think uh, has been presented. One is, is that vitamin C is toxic to tumor cells. Two is that uh, concentrations of vitamin C that kill tumor cells can be achieved in humans using intravenous vitamin C infusions. Infusions of a bolus, or that, we are talking about that 60 grams, followed by slow infusion, can result in sustained concentrations of vitamin C in human plasma. Lipoic acid enhances vitamin C induced tumor cell toxicity. Vitamin C in blood Concentrations achievable through oral supplementation is capable of increasing collagen production in tumors, by tumor cells. Vitamin C in doses up to 50 grams a day infused slowly uh, has not proven toxic to terminal cancer patients. And lastly, some cancer patients have had complete remissions after high dose intravenous vitamin C infusions. In one of my little books of vignettes of medical history entitled Medical Mavericks, I recount how physicians as early as 1590 recognized the value of citrus fruits uh, in preventing and treating scurvy. 
And even though Dr. John Woodall published in 1617 in a book, The Surgeon's Notes, his advice of carrying lemon juice on voyages to prevent scurvy was really ignored, and more than a million sailors died of scurvy in the next 200 years. Not only that, they were flogged and beaten because they were lazy and tossed off the boats. Not a happy time. In 1753, James Lind, Dr. Lind, published his studies, performed on the crew of the Salisbury, which was a ship, demonstrating that citrus fruits effectively treated scurvy. His treatise on the scurvy went unnoticed, and Lind went unheard. Forty years after Lind's death in 1794, his concept for the prevention of scurvy was finally put into practice. I can only hope that unlike the response to Lind, doctors and researchers who hear of our findings will be moved to conduct their own studies to discover for themselves how high dose intravenous vitamin C might be useful to those they serve in prolonging and improving the quality of their lives. Now I'd just like to give you a glimpse, I think, of the uh, people in Recknack, without whom I wouldn't be here saying anything. So they've had uh, great spirit and dedication. You know, we're a small ragtag group in Wichita, Kansas, that shouldn't really be able to do anything. So it's uh, very nice uh, to have their spirit and dedication. So I think it. Uh, this time I'll kind of end this presentation and ask for any questions, and we'll kind of go from there. Anybody have a question? On it? Yes. But just a minute, I guess we've got a roving microphone. I think, by the way, before you get started, I think I've answered all the questions on this sheet. If not, let me know. What form of vitamin C do you take daily, and is you take your 12,000 milligrams throughout the day? Well, the question of what vitamin C I take, I, do, I just take gram ascorbs because I'm lazy, and then I have, uh, I take that in the morning with some fruit, and then I take, uh, I might take more than that using uh, emergency, which is a little liquid. I, I, I like that particular beverage. So that's, uh, that's what I do. Once a day? I just take it once a day, yes. Well, I take the 12 grams once a day, and, and if I'm feeling puny, I'll take the rest later on. The, uh, other thing. The, uh, I, I should mention, uh, Bob Cathcart, who is uh, one of my mentors. Uh, Dr. Cathcart is, is an orthopedic surgeon who invented the elliptical hip joint. So he became very wealthy and didn't care what anybody said or thought about him, so he became interested in vitamin C. And he's categorized how much vitamin C each viral ailment requires. For instance, infectious mono takes 100 grams a day, uh, <coughs> hepatitis 50 grams a day, things of that nature. So, but anyway, I've known him for 20 plus years. And he used to have terrible allergies. And uh, uh, I, I can remember at meetings where he literally he just is, he, he's just dripping from everything. And then he, he decided, uh, based on his own uh, look-see at things, that he should take uh, uh, somewhere between 16 and 20 grams of vitamin C a day, which he's done for uh, many years now, I think at least two decades. And he has no allergies at all. And uh, he... Uh, you know, I don't know what else has gone on in his life. He looks younger than his chronologic age. I'll say that. Uh, but anyway, again, it's, 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 it's interesting, yes. Doctor, uh, two or three things. One, uh, what, uh, do we have tablets or uh, multivitamin tablets that have uh, lipoic acid in with them? Well, lipoic acid, generally, you need to take separately. Separately? Mm-hmm. At the moment, I'm sure eventually it'll get incorporated into things. Okay. So, some things have some lipoic acid, like uh, if you want to take something potent, there's something called immunopower, which we use in conjunction with our intravenous vitamin C for our kidney uh, people. Uh, it, it seems that I'm in, indoctrinated that vitamin C, the body expels it fairly rapidly. You need to spread it over in time release or something through the day. Am I completely mis- Guided in that? Well, I, I think in general you're probably better off taking uh, repeated doses during the day. I know that I won't. So uh, the, the choice is, you know, if I'm supposed to take it, at, if I was going to take it at noon, I, I know I won't do that, even though I, even though I set it out and things like that. So I get my blast again. Again, when, if you look at the intravenous uh, concept, you see, if you do the bolus and you sustain it for a little while, 
then the, the level stays up uh, quite a way intravenously. Mm -hmm. And of course, I should say, if, if things are really going bad, I'll take intravenous uh, vitamin C also. But uh, uh, yeah, th there are many people who would say th there really is no time release product on the, on the market. There's, there's uh, stuff that kind of dumps at different okay. times. Time release would be very, very expensive. Uh, but um, they're, um, you know, the best thing, of course, is to eat some good food during the day. And that hopefully would be uh, uh, one, one source of what you're taking. So, uh, one more uh, item, and uh, people that I love have problems with even what I consider moderate doses of vitamin C and diarrhea. Uh huh. Could you help in that? Well, again, I, th I think when you're taking a a diarrhea dose, you ought to back off from that, and that's what you ought to do. Uh, I just my d and of course you can gradually build up. I, I will share just one, uh, one quickie. Our all-time record holder of vitamin C <laughs> intake is a fellow from uh, Oklahoma who's a cotton rancher and a, and a, I mean a cotton farmer and a, and a rancher. And he had been in the hospital multiple times every year for I think the, the five years before we saw him. And this was before we had a lab or anything like that. And I would recommend everybody to go on a bowel tolerance dose, which everybody knows you go up to diarrhea and back off. The next time I saw him, he was taking 75 grams a day and hadn't been to the bathroom in a week. And I remember uh, telling him I couldn't recommend it, but I wish he would, just increase it and see what it would take to have one bowel movement a day. Uh, it took 125 grams a day. Now, this is a continuous, this is a pretty good full-time job. He was taking <laughs> crystals, of course, liquid crystals, <coughs> no diarrhea. Uh, and then I found out that what he would do, he would stand in the field and he would direct the spray plane pilots and they would spray him as they're going over. And when we got him out of the cotton fields doing that, he, he went down to 40 grams a day to have one bowel movement a day, which he continued uh, for the next several years when he saw him. And he was uh, really quite healthy and his spray plane pilot died of cancer and the guy who mixed the chemicals died of cancer. And uh, he was okay. But uh, again, the depends on what you're exposed to as to what you can uh, you can take in and of course what your bowel is like. There are some products like buffered vitamin C or ester C that have less an effect on uh, bowel activity. So you can do a lot of things uh, that way also. I also, by the way, I take an extra gram of vitamin C for every hour less than eight I've slept. Mm. So I'm going to take four more today. Yes. This is all new to me. Are you saying that the, um, the uh, Vitamin C with the lipoic acid creates collagens, and no, what do you recommend of the no, Vitamin lipoic? C by itself stimulates collagen growth. Collagen okay. is, is dependent on vitamin C. Does the lipoic acid help the, col the uh, Li vitamin C? Lipoic acid helps to recycle vitamin C, okay. and it seems to dramatically increase the killing effect of vitamin C on cancer cells makes them more effective. And Again, lipoic acid is another anti antioxidant. And what do you take of that a day? I what mean, do what I take? Would, what would be? I take 300 milligrams twice a day, but it's expensive. Yeah, that's it. Uh-huh. That's just what I'm taking right now. It, next year, I might not be doing that. You know, who knows? Mm -hmm. If there is an extra, you know. You know what? what would you recommend, though, as a normal? Well, again, I, I think it, uh, you know, probably a couple hundred milligrams a day would be a good idea, you know, something like that. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, several types of cancer uh, that you had uh, experimented with. Have you had any experience with vitamin C um, uh, therapy on ovarian cancer? Well, we certainly give it uh, with ovarian cancer, yes. Mm -hmm. Again, again pardon? Does equal amount of success with the other cancer? No, no. Uh, uh, intravenous uh, vitamin C tends to wall off the, the little tumor. It depends on where somebody is, you know, where they are in, the, in their situation. We had one lady who had, had scattered uh, hundreds of little seeds in her abdomen uh, from an ovarian cancer. And when they went back in to look, uh, they, were all they were all surrounded by collagen. And of course, the, uh, and we tried to get them to not interfere with that, but of course, they always have to have their look see so they open them up, which was not the thing to do. Uh, but um, it, it, it seems to be able to help wall off things. Uh, w the, uh, the most dramatic results we have uh, in terms of uh, numbers and things like that 
uh, would seem to be the, the renal cancer and lymphomas. Lymphomas are very uh, responsive, perhaps in part because many lymphomas are probably due to viruses. Vitamin C, of course, is also a very potent viricide. Uh, we're trying to get one or more universities at least interested in giving uh, vitamin C to people with infectious mononucleosis because a few bottles of intravenous vitamin C in the mono is gone as opposed to these poor people who are dragging around for months feeling terrible, uh, which is a shame. Also, with the, my, my bite was not, a spider, was not a brown spider bite, but intravenous vitamin C, of course, is very potent for knocking out the brown spider bites instead of going around having a big slough of your skin and having surgery. So. To learn more about the center, feel free to stop by 3100 North Hillside in Wichita or you may contact us via phone at 682-3100, fax at 682-5054, or the internet at www.brightspot.org.